Ben, you're still there? Yes. Okay. All righty. Now, I, Karen, I don't see Ben's name. Oh, there it is. Okay. All right. It just got crowded down. Well, I, uh, I hear the clock in the other room chime in at six o'clock, so I think we will begin. Uh, and Ben, I'm coming through loud and clear, am I? Yep. Okay, very good. So welcome everybody tonight. Um, my name is Jim Stordahl. I'm an extension educator um, working in Clearwater and Polk counties in Northwest Minnesota and um, have been involved with the, the local foods college since it began several years ago. So it's been an extremely rewarding and successful program and we're just very thankful that you're able to join us tonight. Um, tonight the, the topic is going to be on homestead livestock. Um, the primary focus is going to be on on hogs, but uh, Ben will also talk a little bit about keeping a house count too, so you have milk for the home. Um, just um, a few housekeeping details. Uh, as you entered into the webinar tonight, you were automatically muted, and so if you have questions as you go, uh, certainly feel free to enter them in the chat box, and we will take a break at some point. Uh, perhaps when um, Ben transitions from hogs to to the dairy cow after the hog section. Maybe we'll take some questions on the hogs and then we'll move on to the, to the milk cow. Um, and then at the very end, if you have more questions, certainly you can ask questions then too. Um, it, it's scheduled to be about an hour, but it uh, will just keep going as long as you guys have questions. And um, if you do have a question and you would like to ask something, just remember to unmute yourself um, to ask your question and then maybe hit mute again too so we don't get any background noise. So with that, um, I would like to introduce Ben. Um, ben Arles is, uh, he's currently employed with Nyman Ranch and he works as a field representative. And in that job, he provides technical assistance, uh, provides sales projections and does audits with the farmers based on the protocols of, of the Nyman Ranch. Uh, prior to that uh, is when Ben and I got to know each other very well. Ben worked as a county extension educator for the University of Minnesota uh, before he went back to graduate school. And uh, Ben has been uh, very active in talking about or doing what he's going to talk about tonight. He's uh, got a lot of experience in raising pastured pork as well as pastured poultry too. Uh, not only that, but Ben is a big fan of having a milk cow at home, and uh, over the years, Ben has had uh, at least a couple of milk cows and uh, has sold raw milk and has worked on different dairy farms, um, both uh, conventional and organic, over the past few years. So with that, I am going to pass the baton over to Ben. Um, if you'll, there we go. There we go. Okay. So Ben, you should be the presenter now, and um, when you are ready, you can take off. Okay, here we go. Thanks, Jim, for the kind introduction. Uh, can everybody hear me okay? Everybody's muted, but I can hear you very well. Okay, very good. <laughs> All right. Here's a, a face to my name and my introduction. So you all can picture who I am, and there's a summary of what Jim said. Uh, today's topics, uh, I'm going to focus more on the, the hogs and pig side of things, um, and then go into a little bit of the homestead cow. 
but basically, here's today's topics. Um, I put marketing on top for both of these because for me, marketing it had, was always the most important thing and it's always the most troublesome aspect of operating, you know, in direct marketing. Um, so I think that's actually the most important because you, you have to be able to sell what you raise. And without that, without being able to sell it, it's you have a difficult time of scaling up and really reaching the economy of scale that you need to survive. Uh, and I'll go through some genetics on the hog side and how that relates to production aspect uh, and some basic feed programs. I, I'm not a nutritionist. I was uh, self-taught in that area. I, my formal education is in agronomy. So uh, I had to teach myself some nutrition um, because I was doing a specialty market and wasn't able to purchase a lot of my feed uh, as a prepared feed product. Uh, so I had to make a go of it that way and struggle through a little bit, but I was successful towards the end, so I can share my successes with you guys. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit about infrastructure uh, and then going into the head, uh, the homestead cow, kind of marketing, you know, having one cow, you need a pretty large family to consume all of that milk. Uh, so I'll go through a little bit of the marketing and kind of um, benchmarks and what you can shoot for for that. Um, and kind of physical markers for milk production is actually focusing on the animal itself and what you need to look for, you know, if you're getting your first cow, because um, there are different aspects within each animal that you can look for to give you a good indication whether they'll be a good producer or not. And then I'll also touch on how to feed and maintain and briefly touch on kind of the stuff that I've done and the, with the success that I've had with uh, having one cow. So why pigs? Uh, this is, you know, it's a question that I get a fair amount. Um, I think pigs are pretty unique for a homestead. Uh, being that you don't need a lot of infrastructure, you don't need uh, a $400,000 building, you can raise two, you can raise 20, and it really takes about the same amount of time and about the same amount of equipment. That's kind of what makes pigs special. Um, and doing that, it'll keep your overhead costs low if you use the portable infrastructure, and I'll touch on that briefly. Um, you know, they can easily the operation itself can easily be moved. Um, and if you come up with a, a model that works, you can duplicate that and expand um, almost infinitely based on how much land you have to do that if you're doing it on pasture. Uh, I can speak for this because I myself have moved uh, varying degrees of my operation. I, I have to think back now at least three times. Um, like I said, hogs need minimal protection. What made me think about raising pigs was my first experience was doing pasture poultry. And if any of you have raised pasture poultry, you know that chickens are really easy to, to kill for a predator. Um, I had uh, successes and failures with the poultry um, until I could figure out how to keep the predators away. I, it was really disheartening, so I decided that I uh, should look a little harder at what pigs could offer. Um, and really what benefited me there was with minimal infrastructure and with minimal capital to invest, I was able to get away with having a more hardy animal that could survive and not be... Uh, willingly picked off by a raccoon in the middle of the night. And I say cheap to feed. Hogs convert uh, grains uh, second to poultry as far as uh, feed conversion. And, you know, what interests me in poultry was that aspect was the feed conversion and then also um, the amount of time it took to turn a group over. Uh, pigs obviously take longer than a broiler chicken but you could still do roughly two groups of pigs in one year and uh, it really benefits you in cash flow when you're just getting started. Uh, here is uh, what I consider to be the management picture. 
really, when you're just starting out with anything, you know, you need to always ask yourself, well, what's your resource base? How much money do you have? What do you have available for buildings? Uh, what's your water situation? Um, then you go into genetics and feed and nutrition. How much labor you have available? And then there's that the devil of it all, the marketing side of things that most people usually struggle with. So here is just kind of a an, you know just a generalized picture of kind of the two varying degrees on the spectrum. Uh, on the left side of the screen, you know, you have the super lean, double muscled uh, pig that's going to be raised generally in confinement. Uh, and on the bottom side of that is also what you get on the end of it, is the product. Um, you know, and if you go in the grocery store, that's basically what you see. Uh, and then on the right, you know, I just pulled up a heritage breed. This is a Berkshire pig. Um, and really the meat quality side of things that I focused on in my own operation, and then that also we focus on in Nyman Ranch, is we want to have that marbling there in the middle of that loin. And what that does is it offers up uh, flavor and juiciness so that when you're cooking that, you have a better eating experience. And if you just look at these pigs visually, you'll see that the ones on the left are lean and the one on the right has a little more flesh to it. Uh, and that, that comes into play several factors that we'll talk about here going forward. So really, we don't, when you think about genetics, what really does that impact? Well, it impacts the pig behavior. I've raised uh, pigs similar to the ones on the left when I had some disease issues when I was just getting started. Uh, and my wife and I found that uh, those pigs that are more lean uh, were harder to handle. They were more aggressive. You would walk in the pen and they would nip at your legs and uh, based on what we were feeding and how we were raising them, they didn't do well at all for us. Um, so pretty much from then on, we decided that we better figure out how to, how to have our own sows and how to successfully rear our own pigs uh, within our management system and with what we were feeding so that we could go forward uh, with our own stock and make money and and ultimately we ended up selling some breeding stock as well. Um, genetics will impact the feed conversion. Uh, those pigs on the left will probably, you know, the more aggressive pigs that are up um, chewing on stuff and not laying down in the sun relaxed, uh, the more aggressive ones will eat eat more feed and so in turn if they gain more weight uh, every day, then on the overall, it'll take less days to get them to market size and their feed conversion will be a little bit better. Uh, and then going back to that meat quality that we already touched on. So within my experience and within my, my job now with Nyman Ranch, uh, we really focused on heritage breeds uh, and generally they do best for outdoor project production methods. Uh, I find that they have to have some fat to thrive in the, the harsh environment of both hot and cold. Now people think, oh, you know, having fat in the hot, well, it's, it's a insulation of sorts. Um, you know, and going back to the meat quality, it's the flavor and moisture during cooking. Um, and I, I've always found, um, you know, it really is a selection game. Um, you know, at least on the farrowing side of things, when I've recruited people for Nyman Ranch and getting them started, uh, farrowing pigs, they always ask, well, can I just go go to the sale barn and buy some gilts and raise them that way? And my response is always, you know, you have to think about where those pigs are coming from. Because now we've had many decades of raising them in crates and we've bred a lot of the mothering ability out of them because back in the day when people didn't have crates and they were farrowing out in huts or just loose farrowing, those sows to stay around, they had to be a good mother and they had to take care of their pigs. Uh, so, so going back to that is really a selection issue 
And it's always best to find somebody that's doing what you want to do and seek them out and try to buy some breeding stock from them. So here's a picture that I took. Uh, these were some of my pigs. And this was uh, November of 2015. Two days before this picture, it was 55 degrees. And these pigs, I think, were about oh, six weeks old at that point. Um, and from 55 degrees, it went to zero degrees and it snowed. So for these, you know, you could see these little pigs out here running around in the snow and the cold, and they basically look unaffected. Um, and I, I really didn't have any issues with that. I had to quick scavenge and get a little um, insulated hut for them so that they would stay warm at the night. But, uh, you know, they're out and they're eating and, and all seems well in the pig world on a zero degree day there. So going, you know, speaking to the resource base, um, you know, what, depending on what you guys want to do, uh, do you want a feral? Well, if you want a feral, what buildings do you have? Do you have any buildings? Do you have huts? Uh, what do you have for labor? Uh, how do you want to breed them? Do you want to use a boar or AI? Generally, the rule of thumb that I follow is one boar to five females. Um, if you do any more than that, the semen quality will go down and you'll get uh, small litters. Your litter size will go down. Um, AI is actually pretty easy. It is not like a cow. Uh, you can YouTube this and I think you'll be pretty confident uh, at least to try it. Um, or do you, you know, if you're just getting started, do you want to buy pigs and just feed them out? Uh, you know, minimum shelter is needed, and really, if you're gonna, you know, do this to a scale where you're gonna sell pigs, and you can find somebody to feral sows that are that raise quality pigs, uh, you can actually utilize your buildings a lot better by filling them up and always making sure that your numbers are there that you need. So here's some different farrowing options. Um, up on the left upper hand corner, you'll see uh, the raised deck with the crate there. Uh, and this is what I'm talking about when you're breeding the mothering ability out of them. Uh, that sow can only get up and lay down. And these pigs have heat lamps on both sides. And, you know, that sow can't, basically can't crush those pigs at all. On the upper right hand side is what we call a sow joy pen. Um, these can generally be found if you look in like an Iowa Craigslist ad, there are a ton of these out in people's trees. Uh, so you guys, if, if any of you are thinking about farrowing and uh, are interested in something like this, you can see that there's crush bars on the sides and on the back. And uh, in the front there where the feeder is, let me try to get an arrow, where this is the feeder. This can, this whole thing can actually, where the feeder is locked on, can actually be taken out and you could use that as a free stall to give those sows a group area uh, to go in and lactate. Uh, we usually recommend uh, about two weeks when those pigs, you can put a roller bar across there instead of the feeder. And when those pigs can jump out of there, then we usually say just open it up uh, or move them into a different group lactation area. Uh, the University of Minnesota Morris has done a fair bit of research on this uh, as far as the group lactation and the natural farrowing systems. Uh, so you guys can look up that research uh, and they also have that stuff on their website. Um, and on the bottom left, this is just a porta hut. Um, with porta huts, you can see the roller bar here is kind of what I'm talking about. Uh, with a porta hut, you know, kind of going back to the selection game, if you have a sow that lays with her butt towards the opening, that's not a very protective sow. You want that sow to face with her head towards the opening so that she can see anything that's coming her way. Um, and this picture on the bottom right is how I've farrowed in the past. And I just had sows running around loose in like a cattle loafing shed. And 
one sow would pick this corner, another sow would pick the other corner, and that works really well if you've got sows that are farrowing within about a week of each other. Uh, so if you, you know, if you want to get that tight of breeding, then you may want to think about getting more than one boar at that time so that you can keep your pig numbers up. And also, um, you know, once these pigs start getting a wider age spread, then you'll have a competition issue and the older pigs will go down and kick the young pigs off when that, when the sows start to lay down and nurse. If anybody has questions, uh, make sure to type them in the chat or you can raise the little hand right above the chat box. So for fairwing pigs in the Nyman Ranch system, uh, our protocol is the sow needs to be able to turn around and care for her young. Um, and our minimum on pen size is 64 square feet. Um, 81 square feet if using a freestall system, and that's what I talked about with the sow joy pen. Uh, and you must have bedding, um, not wood chips. The sow has to be able to build a nest uh, and manipulate that bedding with her mouth. And it really just comes down to an animal welfare thing. Um, you know, we're, we're trying to put a premium on the product and pay our farmers a better price on what they could get on the conventional market. And so to do that, we have to satisfy and appease uh, the PETA folks and, and the Humane Society people. Uh, for finishing pigs, uh, we generally go by 14 square feet if they're loose housed in a hoop barn or a pole shed with windows in it, something like that. Um, if they have outdoor access, we require 18 square feet at a minimum. And they need to, each pig needs to have six square feet of bedded lying area. And they should have enough space where they don't have to lie down on top of each other. Um, you know, so we want them to be able to spread out if they want. Uh, and kind of, you know, going back and touching on that animal welfare issue is huge. And we see, you know, in the conventional, in, you know, in the industry, uh, you know, with the Burger Kings and all of the restaurants going to gestation, create free and all of those sorts of things. We're really trying to be uh, a leader in this and we're generally recognized as the leader in this sort of system in the natural system. Uh, so just to touch on pig behavior, these are all pictures that I took of what I was doing. Um, this you could see when those, when the sow lies down, she gets pigs from everywhere. Um, and you can actually, you know, going back to farrowing close to each other, if you have two different sows and one sow has four pigs and another sow has 14 pigs, you can actually cross foster and take pigs from the smaller litter and put them onto the sow, uh, or with the big litter and put them onto the sow with the smaller litter. And so each sow will be able to maintain those number of pigs and maintain her body condition so that she can breed back and produce more pigs. Um, and really it's quite interesting when you have them in groups like that and they can just run around is they, they group up fast. Um, you know, you can see all of these pigs, there's about three litters worth of pigs there and they all, that was a nice day. I think that was about a week before the weather turned cold. Uh, so they like to lay in the sun and, and pretty much what they do is eat and sleep. And then here you can see later that summer, um, it's nice and green and I've got some pigs out eating some grass and they're having a good time exploring there. So feed, uh, continuing down the, the management picture, is you always need to find the best quality feed that you can find. Uh, don't try to skimp by and find some, you know, maybe some screenings, uh, but generally you should always try to find good test weight grains. Uh, watch for vomitoxins in small grains. That'll really throw your breeding off. Um, and I always focused on weaning at later ages, and I, We'll touch on this with the when I go over the feed rations that I used. And weaning at later ages, really the research that I've read shows that 
the the later you wean, the better the the healthier the pig will be, and the faster it'll gain weight in the early stages of its life. Uh, so if you're not going to plan on feeding blood plasma meal and animal byproducts and really cranking up the protein on those pigs, then weaning at later ages will help with those starter diets. Um, and I just did, when I was doing my feeder rations, I just balanced uh, just using the good old Pearson Square method, uh, just taking a basic protein and a basic carbohydrate, and you get your protein that way, and you guys can Google that, and it's pretty simple to figure out. So here are the the rations that I used, um, and I was selling to a corn-free, soy-free market. Uh, so really, the old standard is uh, barley and field peas because those amino acids really blend together really well. Uh, versus the corn and soybean diet. So if you guys are wanting to write this down or something, uh, I'm going to just pause here for a second and uh, you can quick capture that. And here's the next one. Uh, so if you saw uh, the first one was just a starter diet, and basically it had more more field peas in it than barley. Uh, and then as they grow older, uh, you'll lessen the protein and increase the energy content of the feed ration, and just to match and be more cost effective. Hey Ben, and we have one question come in. Um, someone asked, "What does the premix consist of?" Oh, the premix will consist mostly of uh, just vitamins, calcium, phosphorus. Um, are you looking for a specific one? If you're looking for uh, animal byproduct free, uh, Hubbard has a whole line of products that um, that are certified under our system, under the Nyman Ranch system. Uh, they have some that have no amino acids. They have some with some amino acids in it. Uh, it's, there's a wide variety of them. Um, you know, the the biggest thing I have to watch for with Nyman Ranch is uh, the the animal byproduct industry is huge, and they'll try to sneak that stuff into anywhere. Uh, so, like the choice white grease, which is just fat. Um, and they have animal fat, and really all that is is just put in there to decrease dust. Uh, so it's, it's really just to squeak it in and get rid of it. So does that answer the question, or do you want me to go more in depth? Um, I'm not seeing any follow-up questions, um, but I'll let you know if other ones pop through on that. Okay, very good. Oh, um, somebody asked if we, you could back up to the other chart, though, briefly. Okay. And I'll just let people know, too, um, you should be able to, in the upper left-hand corner of your screen, click on uh, little arrows right below the word Local Foods College, um, and that should be able to take you through then slides. Uh, as he advances or goes back, it'll pull you to whatever slide he's on, but um, just so folks know if they want to look at something a little bit longer. I think you're good to go on, Ben, by the way. Okay. <laughs> Sorry okay. for the interruption. There is a, a research publication that South Dakota State University put out that uh, is a general guideline that I followed with uh, doing the field piece. So if you guys are interested in that, um, you can contact me. Uh, I didn't put a link to that on here, but uh, if you're internet capable, you can find that on your own, I'm sure. Uh, so here's an example that I have. Uh, just with some pigs that I raised uh, when I sold them, they're 310 pounds. Average carcass was 230, which is about a 74% yield, which is pretty good. Um, and over their time, they gained a one and a half pounds, which you know, going against the industry standard is pretty low, but for me, I considered that pretty good. Uh, here's some standard uh, rations with corn and soybean meal. Uh, you're able to increase that protein content down there. 
Uh, just because of the soybean meal is a higher quality protein, you can add more in without decreasing um, without decreasing the average gain of those pigs. So these are just, uh, I'll go back to the first one. So this is uh, wean to 100 pounds. And by no means is this, um, I should make a claim that I don't uh, take any responsibility of these rations. But uh, <laughs> generally speaking, this will get you a long ways and it'll get you a starting point. Uh, and if you guys are mixing your own feed rations and you want it to be more cost effective, by all means, play with it. And, uh, you know, internet is a great source. And like I say, with that Pearson Square, corn and soybean meal is about as simple as you can get. Uh, when you start blending more complex ingredients, then it obviously is more complicated, but this is a great place to start. So we can do 100 pounds. Um, that's that one. Uh, 100 to 200 pounds, and really you just see the soybean meal going down, like I said before, and the corn portion of it going up. Um, you can add oats to this to bulk it up um, and to increase the fiber content when those pigs are small would probably be beneficial. Uh, some people add in rolled oats as a, just to slow the digestion down uh, to decrease the scours. And we'll just continue, you know, and so this would be a basic three-phase ration. I've got people that I work with. Uh, that have three nursery rations, so they're dealing with eight or nine rations in all. But most of those people will get it from a, a feed mill, uh, so the, they are able to be a little more exact with those rations. So again, let me know if you guys want to go back to these. I'll continue on. Uh, I see I'm at 6.30, so I, I need to hurry a little bit. Uh, some alternative ingredients. Um, I've never used the bakery waste. I know some people do. Uh, I would just say if you're going to do that, watch out because you can get, uh, depending on the oil content and the, the greasy content of the bread or whatever you're getting, uh, one thing with pigs is whatever you feed them will actually, you know, the fat on those pigs will take up that the flavor of what they're eating. So you can play with that. Um, and really, if you want to play with that, it's about the last 30 days. Uh, when you're fattening, fattening them up, that you can that you can play with the flavor of of the fat and the meat. Um, dairy, uh, a pig will do anything for milk. Uh, so if you guys have trouble loading um, um, milk and vegetables, I used to raise pigs, and there was on this farm where I was renting, there was a guy who had six greenhouses uh, broken up. There's four of tomatoes and two of cucumbers, and whatever he wasn't able to sell at farmer's markets, I went through and gleaned up and fed them all to the pigs. So it can be a portion of the ration. It can't be a complete uh, ration. Uh, so just keep that in mind. And pigs do a really great job of turning vegetables into meat. Uh, um, and I say, okay. I have a quick question for you, Ben. Speaking of the last uh, 30 days and the flavoring of the fats, um, mm -hmm. do you have you ever added, um, you know, fed on nuts or, or anything as they do um, a little bit on the East Coast or in Europe uh, during those last 30 days for added value? Uh, you could. That's a that's a great idea. I know that in Spain, uh, the acorn finished pigs. Uh, go for a tremendous amount of money. I think they go for like a thousand euros a piece. Um, I, I never did just because I didn't have access to that. Out here in South Dakota, we're on the prairie and there aren't many oak trees. Um, I, if I could, I would, and I would, I would have paid a pretty high dollar rent for access to that. Uh, I did a lot of the milk and the milk will do a little bit of the same thing. Um, and just really the, the fresh, Cucumbers and tomatoes will do that as well. So if you guys, by all means, if you have access to that, uh, to acorns or chestnuts or whatever, yeah, pigs will love that stuff. Uh, so to balance the, the ration, I always had to focus on the protein first just because I was doing the field peas. Um, 
And I, I generally recommend if you're just going to feed a couple, it's not worth the overhead expense of getting a feed grinder and a tractor and all that stuff. So I would just try to buy the prepared feed. Um, you can pick that stuff up. I wouldn't do like the crumble that you can get at runnings. I would go, uh, you know, you can, uh, you could buy like a, t a ton of feed and a bag of dried whey powder. Uh, and then, you know, as you go, you could buy uh, just some corn and adjust your rations that way. So when they're young, you could put in the whey powder and make a more complex protein feed. Uh, and then as they get older, you'll just decrease, you'll just basically dilute that 16% ration out with corn and bring the protein down. Um, squash, pumpkins, and other veggies will provide some carbohydrates, but I think mostly they'll just influence the taste of the meat. Um, and so what's the value of pasture? When I was raising pigs, I tried to get them on pasture as much as possible. And so going back to that uh, Morrison book, uh, a quote in there, a lush legume pasture can replace all protein in the ration after 100 pounds. You know, we're not talking about grass with a little bit of clover or alfalfa. We're talking pretty much a straight alfalfa clover pasture. Uh, I, I never thought of pasture as having much feed value. I focused more on the exercise uh, and getting some more uh, some better muscle tissue, uh, providing the searching instinct for the pig, uh, just providing entertainment for them, plant secondary compounds for health of the pigs, and then basically to round out whatever amino acid profile I was missing with the feed ingredients I was feeding them out on pasture. Uh, just some general pasture management, uh, stocking density per acre, uh, research, depending on soil type and moisture, uh, is about 20 fat pigs per acre. Um, and you'll be able to tell if you need to rotate. Um, basically, the worm cycle works on a three-year three -year cycle for roundworms. Um, I, if I was able to, I would use tillable acres um, just because they will root. I never put rings in. Um, so I, you know, they do tear stuff up, and they'll search for grubs and worms and stuff. So be prepared for some damage. Uh, and generally speaking, they will eat the legumes first, and then the grass. Uh, and really, weeds are preferred. Um, you know, those deep taproot weeds uh, really provide a, a good mineral content and a higher protein for those pigs. Uh, so here's just some general forage species. When I was on uh, the sod pasture, what I would do is, you know, once those, once I rotated the pigs, I would watch the, the weather, and then I would uh, just broadcast seed out on top of where they tore up. I would put that dwarf Essex rapeseed down, and I would put it pretty thick. Um, and I would put that down, and then basically the rain would pound that into the soil, and in four weeks you could rotate back on, and the dwarf Essex rape is really digestible for pigs, and it's also a really high protein. But I will say, if you're going to do that, and it's really sunny, uh, the, the rape seed will actually cause the pigs to get sunburned more easily. So make sure you have a good shady spot for them. Um, and then what I would do further is, uh, during each spring, I would go out and frost, frost seed more clover down, just to try to bring that into a more, uh, legume pasture. So homeopathic feed ingredients. Now, I've gotten more familiar with this with my work with Diamond Ranch. Um, you can buy oregano products uh, that are just a, a dry, you can get a dry powder, or you can get um, a water additive. And this is, uh, you know, if you've got a little bit of like E. coli scours, uh, with one group and you want to make sure that you can help the next group uh, or the pigs that have the scours, uh, by, this actually works really well. It's kind of pseudoscientific just because uh, I don't think universities want to publish stuff on oregano, but it does work um, and I have seen it firsthand. There was a guy that I work with in Nebraska that 
He usually weans groups of about 180 pigs at a time. And within the first couple of weeks of weaning, he was losing about 10% of his pigs. And he started doing oregano in the water and it brought it down to about one or two pigs per 180 that he weaned. So it does work uh, considerably. Uh, garlic is usually, it's the same, antibacterial, antiviral. Um, and some people use the powder as a wormer. I, I never have. Uh, I usually use the diatomaceous earth as a wormer. And the general rule of thumb is 2% of the ration by weight if you're going to do that. Uh, and this can actually be used uh, to kill insects, you know, if they have some, a little bit of mange or something and you want to protect them from that, you can mix diatomaceous earth and vinegar and water uh, and get them in the sunshine and that cuts it down really well. Um, apple cider vinegar, there's some research on that. Uh, I will say the one interesting thing that I found when I used apple cider vinegar, I was interested, I just wanted to try it. Uh, when I mixed it in, I think I did a cup per gallon, uh, and I just had a gravity feed barrel with a hog nipple on it. And when I when I put that apple cider vinegar in the water, uh, it doubled their water consumption. So I thought that was interesting. Uh, you know, if they drink more water, they're going to eat more feed, and they should, in theory, gain more weight. Oh, and I will say, touching on the apple cider vinegar, if you're going to do this, get the one, get the kind with the mother in it, so it's actually uh, worthwhile to feed it. Don't buy the stuff in the grocery store that's pasteurized and sterilized, because uh, you will see uh, almost no health benefit from that. Uh, so for fencing, I've always I discovered that if I tried to use a physical barrier, it was they always got out. Uh, they always rub on stuff and bite on it and try to tear it apart whenever they can get a chance. So I always liked hot wire. Um, if you're going to do an extensive operation, what I would recommend is use one fencer on one wire. So use one fencer for the top wire and a different fencer for the bottom wire. That way if one fencer goes out, you've always got one wire that's hot. Um, hot wire is easier to set up and tear down than than some other physical barriers. Uh, and I will say they train better to hot wire than cattle do, just because they're extremely sensitive. Uh, but you do have to train them to it. And uh, what I always did is when they were small and they're about 40 pounds, and they're trying to get out and explore further. I would take uh, one, just a single wire and put it across one side of their physical fence, about six inches away from their physical fence so that they can see that behind the hot wire. Because uh, a pig's first instinct when they get shocked will be to run forward and try to go through it. So you want them to see that physical barrier behind it and know they can't go forward. Uh, and when they get shocked, they have to back up. And you do that for about two weeks and after that, as long as the fence is hot, you should be home free. Um, going back to those lean hogs that I purchased and had a terrible time with, uh, those were more difficult to train to electric wire. Uh, they would test it more uh, and make sure that it's hot. Um, so, you know, going back to the genetic profile of those pigs, uh, generally speaking, in my experience, you want some fat on them and those heritage breeds actually will do better outside training to the hot wire. Uh, and, you know, move them rapidly to lessen dam damage on the pasture. When, when I was doing this, uh, you know, you always have to change. It's a, it's a moving target. Uh, basically, towards the end, uh, on my last group of pigs that I had, I would actually, I had a sacrifice area. And so if it was going to rain two inches, I just moved them onto the sacrifice area and let the moisture dry up in the soil and then I would put them back on the pasture. Uh, basically I was, you know, I was, didn't have enough land for them to tear the whole place up so I had to try to conserve my pasture 
and that was really a good way to do it because if it rains heavily, they're going to tear the whole place up looking for worms that come up to the surface. Uh, and they will do it. So uh, that would be my recommendation is if you have uh, an area and are capable, have a sacrifice area. And then uh, when it's going to rain, move them away from the pasture that you want them eating on. So here's just a um, uh, hog wire fence that you could buy. Uh, from a number of different places, Kent Cove, Premier One are two different fencing companies. Um, and this was when I was working with the market gardener, so this was just some of his fallow ground. Uh, and you can see just a whole bunch of different weeds there. And so these pigs aren't very big, but they were trained to this fence. And so that I use these, um, this was the only time that I've ever used these this net. Uh, but usually this size, they can you can train those to two wires pretty easily. Uh, here are some gilts that I had, and you can see the two wires. Uh, one's basically nose level when they put it down, uh, or when they're standing rather. The other one's about shoulder level. Uh, for watering, I've basically used hog nipples predominantly. Um, it is nice to have water pressure on the pasture instead of just like filling up a tank and leaving it. I always ran hoses out so that you know on different valves so that I could unhook it and spray them down if it was really hot. Um, my general rule is over 95 degrees. You know, if you've got enough shade and there's some wind, you don't need to spray them down. Um, but if it's over 95 degrees, even if you have shade, I always spray them down. Uh, here's just a basic bulk feeder. Um, that's I use a similar one to this. Uh, there are multiple companies that make it. Um, so you know you can find this sort of stuff in people's trees, and most mostly people just give it away to you. Uh, you know you can do if you're just raising a couple, you can dump it on the ground or you can cut like a 55 gallon plastic barrel down and hand feed and actually hand feeding with a ba with a pail is really nice because if they get out then you can just shake the pail at them and mostly they come running. Uh, so to load the pigs, um, when I was doing it strictly out on pasture with absolutely no buildings to speak of, uh, you put the trailer out nearby um, so the hogs can just get used to seeing it. And I did that about a week before I was bringing them in to slaughter. Uh, and then the day before, I would always let the feed run out so that the pigs are hungry. And then the night before, you know, like the day before, I would open up the trailer so that they could get in it and out of it and just get used to it. And then I would feed them in the trailer for about three or four days before I was gonna bring them in. Um, and then, Basically, they get so used to going in and out of there and eating, um, the hope is the last time that you're going to feed them, you just lock them in and hook up to the pickup and off you go the next morning and not have to struggle with them the next morning. Uh, doing it this way will keep the cortisol levels low uh, and actually is a lot, is a lot more stress-free for all of us. Uh, so deep bedding. Uh, you know, when you can't have them outside or, you know, when it's warm and you need to start bedding them down in the wintertime, uh, there's two different ways to do this. Uh, the deep bedding system, like in hoop barns, um, basically what you do is you just keep adding bedding all through the winter to create a composting base. And so you actually have warmth underneath the pigs and then you just provide a dry area on top of it. Um, and the, really the only time that anybody would struggle with mange is if those pigs didn't receive any sort of uh, ivermectin or if the breeding stock had mange and those pigs uh, didn't get ivermectin or something. Um, to manage the mange, you know, you have to stay ahead of the game. Uh, and basically what you do is you just bed ahead of it. So you just bed and bed and bed more and more and more and eventually uh, the hope is that you bury the mange um, in the old bedding. Uh, and our protocol states we do have a temperature, uh, so less than 32 degrees and eat 8 inches of bedding. Um, 
at 50 degrees is the next break. You need four inches and anything above 70 degrees, you basically just need to provide some bedding for the pigs to lay down on. Uh, so the marketing. Now this is, um, I always tried to pay myself 20 bucks an hour to do this. I, you know, I think you need to value what you do. Um, there's a really good TED Talks on um, knowing the why of your story, why somebody should buy it. Uh, you know, you can, most people just tell them what it is, you know, oh, it's, it's corn free and it's soy free or, or whatever you're trying to add value on. Uh, but why should you buy it? You know, for me, it was, I'm a, I'm a young guy trying to get started. I, you know, I, I have a family that I would like to support. Uh, this is a healthier product for you. It's outside. It's got a higher vitamin content, a higher mineral content. You know, those are just examples of why. You know, don't – most people say what it is. And it, if you can look up the TED Talk, um, I think it's – the guy's name is Simon. Uh, so that's an interesting one to watch if you're interested. Uh, sell the story. Um, mine always appealed to – you know, the environmentalist people, uh, Weston A. Price people that try to avoid soybeans, um, and people that just plain liked uh, a better product to eat. Uh, and really have a payment system worked out. Uh, are you going to take a deposit? You know, you could do this like a vegetable CSA and take a deposit beforehand. Um, just take like a half deposit uh, throughout the year just so people don't flake out on you. Are you going to do it wholesale and sell half pigs and whole pigs? Or are you going to do it retail and find a state inspected or a USDA inspected facility and have them break them down into cuts? If you're interested in just raising a few and getting the most money out of what you're doing, uh, the retail way is, is really the way to go. If you're looking to scale up, uh, the wholesale way is the way to go. And that's really what I focused on was the wholesale. Just, uh, just to try to sell as much as possible. So here's the assumptions, and I've got Excel sheets uh, that are tied to each other. So as feed price changed, I could break it down per carcass pound uh, and come up with what I needed to, to charge people. But there's my 20 bucks an hour. Um, feed costs is basically just the total price divided by the number of carcass pounds that you have. Um, and this is really what helped me is keeping my fixed costs low uh, by using pasture and portable infrastructure. And I always tried to, I always shot for 100 to 150 dollars per hog of net profit going back in that I could um, grow my business with uh, with that profit because I was in graduate school or I had a job or you know so I could I had money to live off of but I was doing this basically. Uh, just to grow a business. Uh, some essential tools, uh, scalpels, hydrogen peroxide if there's a cut, um, iodine is good, uh, and creativity and willingness to do something different is probably the biggest one and the most important one. Uh, just some general knowledge, uh, most, the, most of my pigs went by six and a half months of being born, uh, and my goal was to provide the highest quality meat and meat flavor that I could, um, and I wanted the pigs to have a calm demeanor so that my wife was willing to handle them uh, and that I could have people come out. Um, the gestation is 114 days, that's uh, three weeks, or three months, three weeks, three days. Um, and the way I calculated it is I w wanted to wean at least eight pigs per sow per litter. Uh, and ab about that is your breaking point of whether that sow is earning you money or not. Um, and castrating pigs uh, within two weeks is really the time to shoot for. If you can do it within a few days, that's even better. Uh, one person could do it within a few days. Anything above that, you'll almost need two people. Uh, so basic management for antibiotic free, um, really you need enough infrastructure for basic control of the animals. Um, 
and keeping the pens clean is very important to avoid bacterial infections. Uh, keeping them dry is very important. You know, hog cholera used to be a huge thing. Uh, you know, but you just drive around on all the old farmsteads and you see these small little um, hog sheds and people, you know, used to cram them in there and that's really where hog cholera came is when they're basically in their wallow and it's all in their feces and urine. So, you know, keeping them, keeping them clean and dry with the proper amount of bedding will, will basically get you 90% of the way. Um, if you're starting to scale up, sorting by size will, will help with competition and avoid fighting and injuries um, and have enough feeder space and water space. Our general rule of thumb with Nyman Ranch is uh, one water hole should service 50 pigs or less um, and one bulk feeder will do, I think we say one feeder hole will do five pigs. Uh, obviously, the more you have, the more even the pigs will be towards the slaughter side of things. And if doing that doesn't work, um, some final tricks before you use antibiotics. Um, I, the first thing I would do is do electrolytes and you can even get a vitamin C packet and mix that into a tank of water. Uh, liquid aspirin. Um, you know, this is just an anti-inflammatory. Uh, QC Supply is the place where I always bought this stuff. Uh, and the liquid aspirin usually comes in a concentrate that you dilute down. Um, and then if worse comes to worse, injectable banamine, I think uh, this is just uh, flunixin is the scientific name. Uh, dexamethasone is another common name besides banamine. Um, and follow the label on that. And, you know, if they've got a limp or something and the liquid aspirin doesn't knock it out, then usually the injectable banamine will do the trick. Uh, so with that, that ends the pork side of things. Uh, so if you guys have questions on that, we can talk about it now or we can go through these slides quick. I think there's uh, 10 or less relating to a homestead cow. I'm not seeing any questions come through right now, Ben, so I'd go ahead with the homestead cow. We will continue on then. Uh, these are a picture of my cows that I started with. Um, this is a Jersey cow, and that's her little heifer calf there on the right side of her. And the, the red one on the left was a bred heifer at that point. Uh, so basically a homestead cow. The way that I think about it is... Um, you know, you're making that cow turn un, basically unedible food products, forage, um, into milk, butter, cream, and meat. Uh, and that's kind of the way that I've thought about it and the way that I've thought about the economics of it is, uh, you know, if I'm going to go out and buy it, what am I going to buy it for? And, you know, what is the quality of the product that I'm buying? Uh, breeds, most people like Jersey cows. I know Dexters are more popular uh, just because they're smaller. Uh, but really, you know, a small Jersey cow, I don't think you can beat it as far as a homestead cow. Uh, they're popular. You can find them in most places. Um, you know, they're smaller and they're gentle. They eat less feed than a big Holstein cow. And generally speaking, they'll convert that feed to a high-quality milk product. Uh, more efficiently than a Holstein, uh, and the milk is more rich. So, uh, for feeding it, um, forage, forage, forage. Basically, cows, you know, with the way that their stomach system is designed with the rumen, uh, forages are king. Uh, it's the the way that you'll make the cheapest milk, and actually the the highest quality milk for your family to consume. Uh, and if available, grazing can cheapen production down. Uh, and really, you know, America is kind of interesting. You know, if you go to other countries, you'll see people out with one cow 
um, grazing the side of the roads. And this is actually where uh, Central Park in New York City, to my understanding, came to be. Is, you know, everybody had a house cow and they got to go graze out in Central Park and basically keep their cows out there. Um, and if you feed high amounts of forage, the cows will be healthier, they'll last longer, you can have more calves from them uh, and get a better return on your investment from that animal. Uh, and like I say, this is what they're made to eat. But that said, some grain is okay. Um, I, I wouldn't obsess over the no grain thing um, there are some animals that are nowadays that are being bred specifically for that, uh, but I would say by and large, most of them will probably need some grain to maintain condition and be able to breed back later in the year so that you can keep milking them. So don't obsess over being absolutely grain free. Some grain will go a long ways. Uh, so a rough calculation of how much feed uh, with some waste, uh, conservatively, you know, I always shoot, uh, when I'm running numbers, um, I always budget for more expense and less income. So 4% of waste will get you a proper amount of waste in there and should overfeed that cow almost. Um, so 48 pounds of dry matter, uh, and I always shot for 6 pounds of grain. Uh, split between two milkings uh, to give them a treat and to keep them quiet and steady uh, and, you know, keep them milking because the grains will basically provide energy uh, and all, everybody is an energy eater, so they need more to milk. Um, and if you can, if you're able, uh, grazing, like I say, will cheapen production um, and it'll provide a more nutritious product for everybody to eat. Uh, but I, there's an old trick uh, during spring, uh, if you guys are interested in this, Jerry Brunetti is a nutritionist, he's passed away now, but he, if you look up on YouTube, funny proteins, uh, this is what you try to avoid. When the grass is really high in nitrogen, uh, I would recommend feeding them some hay before you turn them out, otherwise the milk will taste funny. And you'll notice if the grass is too high in protein, uh, they're, when they go poop, it'll be really watery and it'll shoot out their back end. So uh, just provide some roughage for them when you turn them out uh, during the spring and get them transitioned onto that grass. Uh, or if it's dry out, um, they're going to need more to eat and the grasses are going to provide the nutrients that they need. So just watch the animals uh, and you'll be able to tell when they need more feed. Um, basically hay and grain during winter. Some people are looking at uh, sprouts. I've experimented with that. The one thing you need to watch is the amount of mold that's growing in the feed. Uh, keeping mold down is the biggest obstacle with the sprouts. Uh, rough feed costs. Last I knew, uh, some nice alfalfa hay is about $150 a ton. Uh, uh, conventional corn is a little less than $4 right now. Uh, organic corn, I think, is like, mm, I think $8 is low. I think it's more like $9 to $10. Um, pastures around me is $150 an acre. So what, what do you, can you expect from a Jersey cow? Like I said, uh, I calculate low on, the, on what's coming in, so 35 pounds a day. I think would be pretty conservative, or pretty accurate, I think. Uh, so that's about four gallons a day. So like I say, you know, if you've just got a couple people in your family, four gallons a day is quite a bit. Um, and, and this is really where, you know, if you've got a cow, you should almost have a couple of pigs, just because you're, you're going to have extra milk unless you're selling it off. Uh, there is some profit potential. Um, so this is just a breakdown of some rough calculations that I did. When I was selling milk, uh, towards the end, I was selling it for $8 an hour, or $8 a gallon, sorry. Um, you know, and the corn calculation is using that $8. Um, so depending on what you do or what you can buy hay for, this will adjust. Um, and really, if you're doing it for yourself, you just need to decide if you're going to pay yourself 20 bucks an hour 
or however you want to calculate that. But this, you know, without that 20 bucks an hour, that milk is pretty cheap. That's about a, a dollar a gallon. Um, and what I, what I have, ex I actually have made um, small scale silage. Uh, and you can do this with grass clippings. Uh, and just some outdoor garbage bags. I had a guy who grew uh, commercial organic sweet corn and I rented a big wood chipper and I went out and cut it down and I uh, made my own corn silage using garbage bags and I would basically just packed it in and took a shot back and sucked out all the oxygen and it worked out really well. So like I said, the creativity and willingness to do something different is huge. Uh, this was just my little setup, so I found three stanchions. Uh, my cousin had these in his barn, and he gave them to me uh, so I could bring in the three cows all at once, and I had a little bucket milker. I just framed these in um, pretty easy. As long as the cows are calm, they're not going to tear stuff up. So milking. Um, I was able to milk this one cow out on the pasture, and this was her calf. Uh, so when my wife and I ended up moving, we, we butchered one cow and we moved her when she was milking. Um, so I just went out and we had another calf to feed. So here I'm just stealing a little bit off of this cow, uh, to feed the other calf. And this, this, uh, heifer calf, her daughter was still nursing on her. Um, so there are multiple ways you can do it. You know, if you, if you're raising the calf, you can just milk once a day. Uh, if you leave the calf on, it really provides more flexibility and you don't get near as tied down because, you know, you can leave the calf on and just put out a ron bale and the calf will keep the cow milk down and, and you could end up leaving for a day and just have a neighbor check on the cow and make sure they're in. Uh, Hanby Dairy Supply sells uh, bucket milkers. Um, so if you're looking for a place like that, if you want to do uh, scale up, um, Bob White Systems of Vermont sells small commercial units, uh, so that's a place where you can look to. Uh, the thing with dairy farms is they generally have high overhead costs just because of the specialized and single purpose equipment. Um, you know, if once you start dealing with, a, if you, you know, if you've got six cows, you might want to think about uh, buying a small pipeline system and, you know, Bob White systems, they've got like 50 gallon bulk tanks, you know, small stuff like that. So there are, they're coming out with more and more stuff uh, for the small farmer to help you create a little commercial system uh, for your farm. And so you can be an entrepreneur and stay at home and do what you want to do. Uh, for bottling, uh, the biggest thing with milk uh, on the uh, for your home is everything has to be clean. Everything has to be sterilized all the time. You know, there's a lot of press about raw milk, uh, whether you're comfortable with it or not. Um, you know, everything needs to be clean and everything needs to be sterile, and I can't stress that enough. Um, so once you're cleaning up, after you get done milking, you want to do a, a warm water rinse to get all the milk residue out, um, and then hot, 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 soapy water, and sterilize. Uh, and, and all of these supplies can be purchased at Mills Fleet Farm, or if you've got a lot of dairy farms in your area, there's going to be a dairy supply truck. Uh, but if you've got one cow, you know, most of this could be purchased at a farm supply store. So, like I said, what do you, you know, say you want to start on this and you've never had a cow, what do you look for? Here on the left, I'll show you this. This right here is called the milk escutcheon. The wider that is and the further up it goes from the udder to the vulva, the more milk they're going to produce over the long run. The wider it is, the more milk they're going to produce in the short run and the long run. So here you can see this goes all the way up and it's pretty wide. And these are called the escutcheon mirrors. See this uh, area where the hair goes out on the back of the leg? That is a butterfat indicator. So that cow is going to have pretty high butterfat. And sometimes on cows, they'll have sw swirls on the back of the udder 
Uh, and if there's a swirl there, then that cow is going to have high protein content in the milk. So uh, those are just some things to look at. So the escutcheon mirror, they're going out on the leg. The, hot, the further out that goes on the back of the leg, the more milk fat that cow is going to produce. And then the escutcheon going from the back of the udder up to the vulva is going to be the amount of milk she produces uh, and the longer she'll stay in peak lactation. Uh, and this is a cow. If you guys want some books to read, uh, Newman Turner is an old English man who wrote about basically sustainable agriculture. And these are some cows that he had. Um, you could see the depth of body on this cow. So going down to the bottom of her belly, to the top of her back, uh, you want that cow to be the, ma the majority of her landscape profile. You want that cow to be mostly body and the hips should be wider than her shoulders. That's gonna help with calving ease. And you want a nice wide brisket on this cow too. There's her brisket. And what that means, so if you have depth of body and a wide brisket, then you're gonna have larger organs so that cow will stay healthier for longer. And there's a man by the name of Gerald Fry in Arkansas uh, at a couple of conferences that I went to is where I picked this up. up. It was where I picked this information up. Uh, and I have a reference for his book uh, in the back of this. Uh, so for breeding back, like I said, you want to have the grain, uh, you know, if the cow needs it, uh, give her what she needs so that you can maintain production in the long run. Uh, proper nutrition is important. Uh, and when a cow is in a negative energy balance, uh, this is where it's difficult for her to conceive and this is actually has a condition is called ketosis. Uh, mostly this happens in the beginning of lactation on larger dairies. Um, when her milk drops and she starts producing a lot of milk, she's gonna start uh, to mobilize energy off her back uh, in the form of fat, and that's a metabolic disorder called ketosis. Uh, and so when you're breeding back, you know, think about this. Do you wanna breed back to a dairy breed? or you want to breed to a beef breed and have more of a beef animal? Uh, do you need another a chance at another uh, dairy cow, or do you want to have a better beef breed so you have an animal for your freezer? Uh, bull or AI, if your neighbor's got a bull, that's probably easiest. Um, otherwise, there is a chance to AI with a professional in your area if you have dairy farmers in your area. Uh, general conclusions. Uh, basic management is the same as hogs. Uh, good feed and fresh water will get you the majority of the way. Uh, clean and dry bedding is going to keep the diseases away. Um, low stress and proper handling is will finish up the management of cows. Um, and historically, cows and pigs have gone great together. Uh, far, dairy farmers uses basically sell strictly the cream off of the cows and they would actually feed the skim milk back to the hogs and that's basically how they fatten the hogs up. Uh, and I will say that both of these enterprises benefit from scale. If you've got one cow, uh, you have to buy all the equipment for one cow and a second cow doesn't add very much as far as equipment and it uh, will increase the efficiency of your time use. Um, and pigs, especially if you've got two pigs, it doesn't take much to go to 10. And from 10, it doesn't take much to go to 20. Uh, so these things uh, do well with scale. Here are the resources that I mentioned, uh, the Feeds and Feeding by Morrison, and there are 20 some editions of this book. Uh, it's been in circulation for a long time. Uh, Dirt Hog is a pretty recent new publication. Um, and for dairy, this feeds and feeding book talks about sheep and beef cows, dairy cows, goats, hogs. I think you may even talk about rabbits. Uh, there's all sorts of rations and feed ingredients. Um, so that's a good one to at least at least try to check out from your library. Uh, Reproduction and Animal Health by Gerald Fry. Um, the Farm to Consumer, I forgot to see, the Farm to Consumer Legal Defense Fund. Uh, is an organization and they put out a video called Chore Time and that's uh, geared towards 
uh, milk production, small milk production, and how to do that properly. Uh, Hamby Dairy Supply and Bob White Systems are two uh, dairy supply places. And I think that wraps it up. Uh, here's my contact information. I'll go back to the resource page so you guys can look at that if you need to write stuff down. So uh, with that, that ends my presentation. I can take questions if anybody has any. Yeah, it looks like we've got two at least coming in. Um, Jim, I think I'm, I can see them. I don't think that you're getting them on your end, but I'll unmute you quickly too, Jim. Um, so two questions that are coming in are, would acquiring a Jersey cow be similar to that of pigs uh, in that should a person go to a reputable farmer rather than a sale barn to know where it comes from and how it was raised? Absolutely. All right. That's and then an easy, the, It's an easy question to answer. <laughs> <laughs> a following question is, with hog rooting behavior, how deeply will they cultivate or is it dependent on time allowed to root? Uh, um, that's a function of time. So, you know, basically what they'll do, uh, my observation is if they get started in one area, uh, they'll keep working on that area and make it bigger. They won't, they won't spread out across the whole area right away. They'll start working on one area and start flipping it. If it's sod, they'll start flipping it over um, and work on one area. So, so if that happens, what I would always do is take another piece of wire and just fence that off so they had to so they couldn't work on that area anymore and I would go over the top and seed that back down because if you if you don't seed it down something's growing because something's going to grow there so I always thought I would rather have a beneficial species of forage uh, like the dwarf essex that's going to grow really fast and be a nutritious forage for the pigs uh, instead of thistle or something similar I'm waiting to see if um, more questions come in, but we've had one comment uh, that says, thank you for all of the information. I honestly knew nothing about raising either hogs or cows. Thank you again. So, great job, Ben. <laughs> and I'm waiting, but uh, not many questions have come in. And one other last thing, just to remind folks that um, if um, if they had friends that were hoping to be on tonight and could not attend, uh, this is online and they can watch it at a later time. Or if they're interested in watching parts of it again, uh, certainly that's available. Thanks for that reminder, Jim. If there are no more questions, um, Jim, you want to wrap us up? Well, once again, thank you everyone for attending tonight and a special thank you to Ben for um, will, being willing to do this. Uh, I, I kind of posed this to Ben a couple of weeks ago and I dumped it on him and sort of a sudden, all of a sudden. So Ben had to scramble a little bit to put together a presentation and um, I've done presentations together with Ben before and as, as always, Ben does a wonderful job and it was very educational. So thank you very much, Ben, for doing that. And um, with that, uh, if uh, no one else, anything else, we will close it out for tonight. And Ben's contact information is there as well. So if you have some follow-up questions, certainly you could visit with Ben. Or if you can't find his email or whatever, you can always email um, you know, myself or Karen and we can get you to him. So. Any parting words, Ben? Uh, I'd just like to thank everybody for coming, and I hope you uh, learned a little bit of information. And if you do have any questions, certainly feel free to contact me uh, either by telephone or my email provided there. Right. Well, good night, everybody. Thank you again for attending.